Father God, thank you for this day and thank you for this time, Lord. And I pray that your message of truth would go out to whoever needs to hear this, Lord. I pray that people's minds, hearts, souls would be open to receiving the word of God and to receiving the truth. And I pray that my viewers or whoever stumbles across this Bible study on YouTube or comes in live, that the veil of their mind will be lifted, Father God, and anything they're struggling with in their mind, the lies from the enemy, the sin that they're caught up in, the lies from the secular, secular non-believing world will be dispelled in the name of Jesus and that your perfect, pure, radiant light would, would pierce through their minds, Father God. I pray that you encourage them, motivate them, comfort them, bring them out of bondage as we're going to study in tonight's word. And I pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. So last week we studied a little bit from the book of Ezra. And I went over some verses. So I want to do a quick review of what we talked about and what we learned last week. Ezra chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let, let us build with you. For we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esharadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to you will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. The Jews were exiled to Babylon, and then King Cyrus, after approximately 70 years of the Jews being kept captive in Babylon, <clears throat> King Cyrus allowed them to go back um, to Israel to rebuild their temple. Captivity is a metaphor for sin, as sinners were held captive by our sin, and only God can free us from our sin. Um, specifically Jesus Christ in his death on a cross and resurrecting from the dead. That, that was his sacrifice. That was God's sacrifice to mankind to save them from their sin and to save them from death, okay? Not physical death, but spiritual death. And I talked about how people are going to come into your life claiming Christ and you have to be a leery of them and a bit on guard, just because people claim, claim Christ doesn't mean they follow Christ, right? So again, real quick, now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord God, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel. They were their adversaries, and they were saying, hey, we're like you. We sacrifice too, um, a Jewish practice and tradition back in those times, right? And there's, the Jews politely declined and said, no, thanks. You know, King Cyrus said, it's, it's our duty to do it. And we're going to do it as God's um, chosen people, the Jews, the Israelites, we're going to do it. I want to talk about Babylon and what Babylon is and what Babylon means in the Bible. Okay. Because the Jews are coming out of captivity from Babylon. All right. So we're going to turn to the book of Genesis, but uh, I'm going to read Genesis 11, one through nine. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people integrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one, one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from over the face of all the earth. 
and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Babel is an ancient city. In fact, it was the first city that was established after the global flood of Noah's day. The flood destroyed every city that existed prior to it. Outside of Noah's farm, this was where civilization re-began and more properly self-destructed. Babel was ultimately destroyed and left in ruins. There are archaeological remains of Babel that can be studied today. So I want us to get our bearings and kind of understand this place of Babel. And, and I'm going to connect it to modern day. If you Google the word prophecy, you'll discover that millions of people are wanting to know where we're heading. More and more people today, in fact, are consulting the psychics to understand what happens next. But can we really know the future? The ancient Babylonians definitely thought they could. They used various methods to predict the future in order to try to stave off any impending doom. For example, here's a bird omen tablet, which can be found in the British Museum. You see, they believed the behavior and the appearance of birds were omens of the future. Then, for predicting the future in domestic affairs, the Babylonians applied drops of oil on water, and the patterns of oil were supposed to indicate what would take place in the future. Now, of course, we smile at such attempts to predict the future. But seriously, if you were looking for a source that could predict future events, that source would need to exhibit two things, if you were to put your trust in it. Firstly, historical accuracy meaning it presents facts it mentions accurately. It's not founded on myths, legends and fairy tales. And secondly, a proven track record of fulfilled predictions. In other words, a very high predictive batting average. Well, is there such a source available today? Well, some say this book, the Bible, is such a source. So let's test it. Firstly, let's look at the historical accuracy of this book about the history of Babylon. Now, the Bible accurately records the names of people and events that took place around 600 BC when ancient Babylon was the Middle East's number one superpower. For example, this piece of real brick from ancient Babylon has the name of King Nebuchadnezzar on it. And this king and his story is documented in detail in the Bible. Archaeology and ancient history, you see, all agree with the biblical account of how King Nebuchadnezzar rebuilt Babylon and destroy the city of Jerusalem. The biblical books of Kings and Jeremiah inform us that King Jehoiachin of Judah, which was a part of Israel, and his family were taken captive by the Babylonians and given food rations. Let me read it to you. And as for his, Jehoiachin's provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king of Babylon, a portion for each day until the day of his death, all the days of his life. Amazingly, archaeologists digging in Iraq, where ancient Babylon was located, discovered a clay tablet which agrees precisely with what the Bible recorded so long ago. This tablet from the Pergamon Museum in Berlin is known as the Ration Tablet of King Jehoiachin. And notice what it says. Ten sealer of oil to the king of Judah, two and a half sealer to the offspring of Judah's king, four sealer to eight men from Judah. Now imagine it. The very ration tablet of the king, which was also mentioned in the Bible. You see, that's what we mean when we say this book is historically accurate. But that's not all. The Bible informs us of another method the Babylonians used to predict the future. That of examining a sheep's liver. Notice what's written in the Bible. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways, to use divination. He made his arrows bright, he consulted with images, he looked in the liver. You see, the king of Babylon is wondering what decision to make. So what does he do? He consults the liver. Now we know from tablets, such as this model of a sheep's liver, that that's exactly what the ancient Babylonians did, so that they could know what action to be taken in the future, or to avoid disaster down the track. You see, once again, archaeology proves that the Bible is a trustworthy source of information. Okay, so the Bible is historically accurate, but does the Bible have a proven track record of fulfilled predictions concerning Babylon? Around 700 BC, 
Isaiah, one of the biblical prophets, predicted that the Babylonians would carry the king, his family and his goods off to Babylon. Listen to this. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried off to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. The Babylonian Chronicle in the British Museum mentions this very event precisely, just as it was predicted in the Bible. And then Jeremiah made these predictions around 600 BC. Notice what he said. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, in causing you to return to this place. These prophecies were dramatically fulfilled under King Cyrus, whose bitter Persian armies not only conquered Babylon in 539 BC, but Cyrus allowed the Jewish captives to return home to Jerusalem shortly after. And this is attested by the famous Cyrus cylinder on display in the British Museum today. Finally, the Bible predicted that Great Babylon would become a heap of ruins. Notice what the Bible says. And Babylon shall become heaps without an inhabitant. And you know, that's exactly what we find when we go to the ancient side of Babylon today. It's a heap of ruins. You see, this book is historically accurate with a proven track record of fulfilled predictions of 100%. And it's therefore the best source for truly knowing the future. If you've been living in America for the last whatever years, <clears throat> our society has slowly become more and more corrupt, and it's become more and more like Babylon. I mean, it, the, the evidence is clear, and I don't have to go into like super details, but everything that's going on um, with the sin running rampant, being accepted, being you know people saying that sin's okay basically and and it's a very bad place for a nation to be and it's a very bad place for you to be as an individual and i can speak to this because i've lived that life the majority of my adult life has been a lukewarm fake christian and i believe god had me the whole time praise god because he is the almighty god and i was in his hand the whole time even during those years of me wandering and not really taking my relationship with him seriously. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will stir up the spirit of a destroyer against Babylon, against the inhabitants of leb Kamami, and I will send to Babylon winnowers, and they shall winnow, winnow her, and they shall empty her land. When they come against her from every side on the day of trouble, let not the archer bend his bow, and let him not stand up in his armor. Spare not her young men, devote to destruction all her army they shall fall down slain in the land of the chaldeans and wounded in her streets for israel and judah have not been forsaken by their god the lord of hosts but the land of the chaldeans is full of guilt against the holy one of israel flee from the midst of babylon let everyone save his life be not cut off in her punishment for this is the time of the lord's vengeance the repayment he is rendering her Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken. The nations drank of her wine. Therefore the nations went mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her and let us go each to his own country, for her judgment has reached up to heaven and has been lifted up even to the skies. The Lord has brought about our vindication. Come, let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. Sharpen the arrows, take up the shields. The Lord has stirred up the spirit of the king of the Medes because his purpose concerning Babylon is to destroy it. For that is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for the temple. Set up a standard against the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushers, for the Lord has both plan planned and done what he spoke concerning the inhabitants of Babylon. O you who dwell by many waters, rich in treasures, your end has come. The thread of your life is cut. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself. Surely I will fill you with men, as many as locusts, and they shall, ri 
raise the shout of victory over you. You're going to see that this isn't just an ancient thing that is done and over with. Okay. Um, Babylon is still very much alive in, in here today. So some more history on, on Babel or Babylon. Babel means confused and Babylon means confusion. The ancient city of Babel was built into a major city and was rena renamed Babylon. In Babel, people built a religious tower, commonly called the Tower of Babel or Pyramid Ziggurat. And the city was built up and was later named ba renamed Babylon. So Babel, which became Babylon, gave rise to the symbolic city of Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great rose in status as pagan religions and its teachings spread worldwide over generations. Hence, from Babel, which became Babylon, people spread religious teachings worldwide over generations, becoming Babylon the Great. God saw a threat to their technology and what they were doing as a people. Um, and the main sin, the major sin of Babylon was their pride. They're exalting themselves, men exalting themselves to a position as if they are God or gods. And this is why the Lord came in and thwarted their plans. And then what I just read said, you know, later down the line, Babel actually became Babylon. And the prophecy I just read here in Jeremiah was talking about the destruction of that, I guess if you could say second iteration of Babel or Babylon. All right, so now we're going to start connecting it to more i guess current times and going into the future all right so we're going to jump to the end of the bible now and we're going to go to the book of revelation revelation hasn't happened yet this is a future prophecy in the bible revelations is considered to be a prophecy about the end times the end of the world and what's going to happen in the future like we haven't experienced this the earth and mankind haven't experienced this yet as i read this scripture um, from the Bible, uh, please compare how this can be applied to what we are seeing today in the world, as well as your own uh, personal struggle with sin in your life. Revelation 18, 1 through 20. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she, will, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, the great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo any more. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble cinnamon spice incense myrrh frankincense wine oil fine flour wheat cattle and sheep horses and chariots and slaves that is human souls the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you never to be found again the merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment weeping and mourning aloud Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, 
and with pearls, for in a single, single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all who trade is on the sea, stood afar off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on her head their heads as they wept and, and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. So this is heavy stuff. This isn't light stuff. You know, those are some very serious words that... um god gave to john that he recorded and has survived you know roughly two thousand years and what does babylon represent in the bible okay so we've covered ancient babylon and now we cover what the lord says about the future in babylon okay and babylon represents evil in the bible babylon is a metaphor metaphor for our relationship with sin and it rep represents the sin of the whole world it represents man's unrepentant heart and unwillingness to turn to jesus christ this whole secular world as well as lukewarm christians which i've been for most of my life like i said um, are in deep trouble and we must disconnect ourselves from the beliefs of the world system today now um, the lord has put this on my heart that whoever comes across this message, um, this is like a dire warning to us today. Do not believe the lies of what people who don't believe in the word of God say about his word. They say that this is a lie. They say that it's been mistranslated. They say that it's not accurate. They say that it's not true. They say that it's outdated. They say it doesn't pertain to modern day man. And I'm imploring my my lukewarm fellow believers, non-believers, believers to remind ourselves that this great and mighty day is coming. And I'm not up here uh, on here saying that I know when that is. The Bible says no one knows when the end is going to be. It could be during this Bible study that the church is raptured. It could be another 20 years that the church is raptured or another 100 years that the church is raptured. But every day that goes by is, is one more day of God's grace and mercy to turn to him before we enter into the literal end of the world. Okay. And aside from that, whether we live to see the end of the world in the end times or not, all of us have a death that's coming. And we don't know when that is going to be either. Just like I said about the end times, the same can go for our, our individual deaths. I could die before the end of this stream. You know what I mean? And I might live another 20 years. I might live another 40 years. But I don't know, you know, and you don't know. So I'm, I'm imploring people, we have to get off of this Babylonian system. And again, Babylon is just a metaphor for sin and evil and self-righteousness and, and man relying on themselves and not God, man struggling with his pride. And I've, I've touched on this in the past, but remember the thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven was his pride. He wanted to take God's throne. Let's see. The only way to unplug from this world system is to seek God and listen to his voice and his word. We're living in very strange times to say the least everything that's going on in the world economically politically morally the the advent of new technologies uh you know ai has gotten smarter and that's just come out in the last year and you we're hearing all sorts of stories both positive and negative about ai and what that's capable of and um i do believe that we are we are living in a, a time of deception and I believe it's unfortunately it's only going to get worse and remember that the devil is the great deceiver the Bible says he's a liar and he's a deceiver and so as Christians we know what his tactics are against the world 
That's his tactics against all of us, believers or non-believers. He deceives people. He's, he lies. He isn't what he says he is. He doesn't display himself as he truly is. And I believe that we're with all that's going on, we're entering into a time of great deception. Um, and the only way that we're going to get through it, that we're going to fight through it and, and endure through it is by being close to the Lord. Because it doesn't take long to go out into this world at your job, turning on the TV, turning on the internet, social media, the people in your lives before you start getting all these messages. You know, we're hearing so many things politically, like I said, politically, socially, spiritually, economically, um, AI, the, the internet, social media, all these voices are coming at us. And without being close to the word of God and solid in that and starting to really understand our Bible, study our Bible, seek the Lord so that we can get closer to him, so that we can discern his voice from the lies, that's the only way we're going to survive and get through this. This is what's changed in me from the old me. When I'm struggling and I don't feel like going to church and when I'm struggling and I don't feel like going to Bible study... And when I start to feel myself slipping into that, like I'm just doing it so that I can do the check mark thing, check it off my Christian to-do list, I, I pray and I, I speak to the Lord and I say, God, I'm doing this because I love you, right? And even if it's a struggle for me to get in my car and drive 10 minutes, 15 minutes to the church and, you know, sacrifice time and energy, I'm like, Lord, I'm doing this for you and for our relationship because I love you. And that's, that's it. That's where it starts and that's where it ends. And whatever God is doing in my life and in my walk and however he uses all this, you know, this Bible study, the men's Bible study, going to church, and then on top of that, daily praying and reading my Bible, whatever the Lord's going to do with that is what the Lord's going to do with that. And like I said, kind of the point of this Bible study is to, to encourage you and to warn you, we have to get off of the Babylonian system, meaning a metaphor for sin and man's unwillingness to repent. Okay. Um, and also, I mean, I believe that America and the whole globe is turning into this modern day Babylon, a literal physical Babylon. Um, that we, I read in Revelation, that whole thing is a judgment against Babylon. And I, I believe it's bigger than just one city, because when God comes back to judge the world, he's not just judging a city called Babylon, right? First of all, there is no more city called Babylon, but he's not just coming back to judge America. He's not just coming back to judge Israel. He's not just coming back, insert any name for a country. He's not just coming back for He's coming back to judge humanity. And Babylon is that harlot that, that she represents sin. And it's no coincidence that she's a female and a woman um, because that, that's the metaphor for enticement, how a man is enticed to a woman to commit sexually immoral acts to her. Well, that's a metaphor for mankind's relationship to sin. We are all enticed to go away from God and to pursue our sin. But as I, as I read in Revelation, needless to say, the end for Babylon is horrific. You know, Jesus says when the tri tribulation comes, the end of the world, it's going to be a time of distress that the world has never seen before. Let's connect it back to Ezra. I promised I was going to, it's going to, I'll bring it back around. I'm bringing it back around. Um, so we went on our tour of Babylon, so to speak. Okay, so back to this period in Jewish history where the Jews are now rebuilding the temple for the second time. Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, and in the reign of Assyrius, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. This connects back to everything from last week and this week and what we just covered with Babylon. When we start to come out of Babylon, 
people are going to come against us. And this isn't to discourage people. This is to encourage us. And I talked about this last week, but I wanted to cover some more verses in Ezra that connects to all this, but I'll read it again. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. So we're called out of Babylon. We're called out of our sin. And God has a purpose for us to start building to start building the life that he wants us to have. He starts to lay the foundation of our life, um, most importantly, in a spiritual sense, right? But that also covers what he wants you to do physically with your life. We all have a set amount of time that we're here. And as we come out of captivity from Babylon and we start to build our life on Jesus, on God, on the rock, there is going to be battles that come our way to discourage us. And there are forces that do not want you to come out of Babylon. There are forces that do, do not want you to build your house on the rock. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to encourage you because again, where it all started with Jesus is where it ends with Jesus. He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. The Bible says that the good work that he started in you, he is going to be faithful to complete that good work. What's your relationship like with Jesus? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it lukewarm? And we all need to like check ourselves about that. We're soldiers in God's army now. And this war is being waged on multiple fronts. Okay, so we have our own sin that we're dealing with. We have the non-believing world that we're dealing with. And we have Satan that we're dealing with. All these three things do come against us, all right? And it's it's helpful to be aware, like I've said before, it's help if you're a soldier in battle, it's very beneficial to know who the enemies are, right? For obvious reasons. If you go into a battle and you don't even know who you're fighting, it's a very it's going to be a very confusing battle. If you go into a battle and they tell you those are the enemies, you know, they this is how they look, this is how they dress, this is how they behave, well, it's going to be a lot better for the soldier for obvious reasons. But without Jesus, this would be a hopeless battle as we are outnumbered. Uh, with Jesus, victory is prophesied. We will win with Jesus. Yeah, so I covered all that. Father God, I just thank you for this time, this last hour, hour and a half, um, that I, I get to do a Bible study on the internet for you, Lord. And I thank you for the people that have come into the chat, I thank you for the girl called M and anyone else who may have been watching and just didn't say anything in the chat. I thank you for those people, Lord. And I prayed this at the beginning and I pray this at the end, but I pray that people's minds will be illuminated by the truth of your word, by the truth of the Bible, by the truth of Jesus's life, by the truth of the gospel. Father, I pray that people's veils would be lifted from their mind especially during these times that we're living through, Lord. It's been a very stressful time since <laughs> up until now, and things have dramatically changed. And I think there's a lot of voices coming from the enemy. Like I said in the Bible study, there's our own crazy thoughts and sins that we deal with. There's what non-believers say is right. And then there's the enemy himself who comes against our mind and attacks us and um, I can only speak for myself, but I know that other people at times feel like, oh, I'm crazy. I'm going crazy. Um, I pray that you dispel that in people's hearts and minds, Lord. I pray that they would be motivated, encouraged, inspired to seek you for them, for themselves. Um, and that you would reveal yourself to them and that you would provide for them and that you would comfort them and that you would give them that joy and that peace that surpasses all understanding. It says in the Bible that you have a peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord. And I pray that for my viewers and anyone who sees this in a YouTube video. I don't know who's going to see this, Lord, but you do. Um, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for our shelter, our clothing, our food. We thank you for our trials and tribulations. We thank you for the good things. And we thank you for the negative things that we may be going through, Lord, because it's all ultimately for your glory. So again, Lord, thank you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.